We're thankful, Lord God, for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you're going to do. So we want to worship you ahead of time. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, take my mind. Help me to think and communicate with clarity. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we want to know, understand uh, in, a, in, a, in a deeper way what it is to be an overcomer. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would impart something today. I pray for divine impartation. That we would grasp the reality. No matter what happens, we overcome. No matter what comes our way, we overcome. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that each one of us would be encouraged by the revelations. By the things that John wrote in the book. And that we would draw strength from it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's give it up. Everybody connected online, welcome. (laughs) Welcome to our morning service. Uh, We started this series last week about being an overcomer or the overcoming life. So we will be on the the next, you know, I don't know how many weeks. I, I never know exactly the number. I know there's seven churches, so, you know, at least seven, but it might be a little more than that. Uh, but the, the idea, and when you read, and, you, you know, it's, it's just amazing. Today we're going to be sharing about the first church, uh, which is the church of Ephesus. But I just want us to go back a little bit when we talk about the word overcome, which is the word nikeo in Greek. And it might not seem much, but, you know, one way to relate It is like the brand Nike. Did you know that? That's where they got the word. It is a Greek word, Nikeo, which means to overcome, to overrule, to get over obstacles. And I'm not talking, you know, I mean, they use that and we've seen, I mean, it is a powerful brand. And, but I want us to understand that because he overcame, we are overcomers. And when we relate to Jesus, which was the emphasis on Wednesday, because I wanted to bring between chapter 2, I mean, chapter 1, it's the, the title in my Bible, New King James Version. It's like the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. And when you go back to the revelation, it's, it's not, we're not talking a baby in the manger anymore. Amen. The revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 1, as you read, it will give you strength. Yes. Because death did not prevail. Even the unbelief of the disciples who walked with him for three years did not prevail. Even the Pharisees, even, I'm just talking about there was all kinds of opposition and he overcame. So whatever is the opposition we're facing now, when we look to Jesus like, no, that's not going to stop me. That is not going to paralyze me. That is not going to prevent me from experiencing God's purpose on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to fulfill the will of God for my life, and so are you. Can you say amen? Amen. Come on, let's give it up to Jesus, because we will. We will, but it has to be. It's it's, it's like there is a different approach, and I feel like John, some author says that it was about the year 95. Uh, So it was about 40 years, and I will be in more detail on Wednesday, so you don't want to miss, or if you can come, connect online. But I will give a little more detail on Wednesday. So we're talking about at least that this church was established 40 years. For oh, 40 years. Since the church was started. And this church was established in the second missionary trip of Paul, the apostle. But when we see now in all the persecution. And we're not talking about a dozen of people or hundreds of people. We're talking about thousands of people being killed in the name of Jesus. Yeah. We're talking about a persecution that, you know, most of us, there is in some nations we see Christians being persecuted and killed for what, for their testimony. But we're talking about a a, a level, uh, I think I forgot his name is Domencius, you know, there's something to his name that is, you know, that that, that he came and that his pressure was to kill Christians. So the church was trying to be quiet. And that's the goal of the enemy. The enemy does not want you or me to have the word of God in our lips. 
Because once we have it, we've heard it today. We heard it through the song. We heard it through the prophecy. It is like it is because of what he did, we overcome. And we, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, not my blood, not what I did, and the word of our testimony. So that word has to be in us to such a degree that it's like, no, I know in whom I have believed. And I know he is powerful. Can you say amen? So we're going to start, and uh, I was kind of, uh, you know, trying to see a title, and since we're talking about overcoming, this first one is, I, I believe, you know, you, you're going to understand a little more, overcoming complacency. Yep. And we're going to see more, but it, it is the first church, and you see why. Revelations 2, 1 says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. To the angel, and you know, many, many people saw that this was talking about an angel, but the word angel or angelos, it's the, it, the meaning of it, it's messenger. So I do believe and I agree with most uh, people that interpret that. It is the pastor of the church in Ephesus. So to the angel, to the pastor of that church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. So to the angel of the church, to the pastor of the church, the words of him who holds. So he talks about that Jesus is in control. Do you believe that? To him, the words of him who holds the seven stars, and I do believe the stars, it is pointing to the pastors. It is in his hand. He is the one who prepares leaders. He is the one who points pastors and teachers. He is the one who is in control, and he pointed that pastor there. He put it that pastor there for a specific reason, but he gives them the message in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstand hallelujah who walks it talking about jesus so jesus is in movement he is walking in his church come on church it's not like well you know it's not that much right no 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 it is so he's in control he points the leaders it is his in right hand right hand represents strength and because it's seven, it does apply to us because it's, the, it's a number of completion. So it was not only for the church in, in Ephesus. Why would it be in the Bible if it is not for us today? But it says in the very beginning that if we read it, if we listen, and if we keep those words, we're blessed. If we read, if we hear, and if we keep those words, we're blessed. So it has to be something like, you know, I confess to you, I, don't read, I didn't read that much until this came to me like really strong that I felt I needed to share. And, and then I've been reading every day, every day. He who reads, he who listens, he who keeps, he is blessed. And if I want to be blessed, I got to read and I got to listen and I got to keep because the enemy is going to try to steal that away. Amen. Stars in the right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And so seven golden because it's precious, it's valuable. Lampstand because it is. Uh, the church should shine in the midst of darkness. The church should not be overcome by darkness, but the church overcomes darkness with its light. Yes. Lampstand. We're here to point people to Jesus. We're here so people can see how to walk in victory. We're here to show how, what it is. What does it mean to be an overcomer? Are you with me? So now look what Ephesus, I believe is the next one. I want us to, for you to have an idea, because sometimes we're so disconnected. It's like, I don't even know where it's Ephesus or what it is. But you have it there, and, and I want you to see it. It's like Ephesus right there in the middle, there. And we have the other churches, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Colossae. But so in our day today, the map is this, because people think, well, where is that? The next map would show right there which is Turkey. Pointed that out, Tom, right there. Right to the side a little bit, down. No, no, right there. I mean, Israel is down there. I believe it's 1,200 miles if you go from Israel all the way around. But, and, I, and I'm learning this as the crow flies. Yes. <laughs> I got it. 
I learned that with George. Because <laughs> we don't have that expression, so, you know. And he said, yes, because the crow doesn't go around. He's like, Phew. So, so as the crow flies, you, you see it right there. So it's Turkey, right there. You see Greece. You see the little boot there, so you can relate Italy. You know, I mean, if you see the map, what the Apostle Paul did, Without a car, without a jet, without an airplane, I mean, without, without internet, and the missionary journeys that he would go, and he would come back, and he would go to prison. I mean, it's quite amazing. I might have that on Wednesday for us. But I just want you to see where is Ephesus and why it's so important. Ephesus was a splendid Greek city in Asia Minor. Uh, in biblical times, the city was known for its theater. I do believe I have the theater there for you to have an idea. That's the theater. Now it's the ruins of it, but you could sit 24 to 25,000 people there. I believe the city was about 200, uh, a quarter of a million people at that time. This is how it would, what it would look like, the city of Ephesus. This is, so that's the theater right there. This is right here. I, I want us to picture that because it's very important. Why would we study? Why would God want us to see something? Why is it so important that we understand what happened in the first church that uh, John, the revelator, or why Jesus would tell him about Ephesus? Now, the other thing is it, it was advanced in an aqueduct system and its temple of Artemis or Diana, which we have the picture too. That's the temple. I mean, they, 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 you know, it would look like that. Uh, the, the closest thing we have is the Pantheon. Parthenon. Par how do you say it? Parthenon. Parthenon in Nashville. We've been there. We've seen it. But this temple would be three times bigger the, than the Parthenon. And it's pretty big. How many of you have seen it? Parthenon? Some of you? Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it looks amazing. But this is a temple of Diana. It was such an elaborate affair that it was counted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it was like a, 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 you know, a prime tourist attraction. Paul first came to Ephesus together with Priscilla and Aquila. Or Aquila. For untold reasons, Paul left them there, apparently at the house of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. I mean, that's a hard name to pronounce. Uh, in one of his journeys, while he was gone, a Jew from Alexandria named Apollos arrived at Ephesus and began to share the gospel. But Apollos had moved to Corinth when Paul returned to Ephesus. And this time, he stayed for two years. From his prison in Rome, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus his famous epistle. So a way to understand would be like, you know, how can we relate or what city in the U.S. would look like? Uh, I mean, Ephesus would really look like New York of our present time. Ephesus was the center of culture. Ephesus was the center of fashion. If you wanted to go to vacation, that's where would you go? Ephesus was a place to go, a tourist city. It was also known, and that's very important, it was also known for idolatry, and it was considered to be the sexual capital of Asia. Amen? Are you following so far? Very important. Now, Revelation 2, verse 2. This is very important right here. I know your works. Because I want us to see, this is not a bad church. This is a pretty good church, actually. Out, out of the seven, you know, maybe this is one of the best ones. Because you see, I know. I mean, that alone should bring the fear of God to all of us. Yes. I know. Yes. What would happen to you if Jesus stands in front of you and he says, I know. Wouldn't that bring the fear of God? I mean, each one of us, like, I know. I mean, you would be like, know what? Everything. I mean, it's, 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 
I don't know, this line of this movie came to my mind just now. You know, I know what you did last summer. Not only last summer, he knows what you did all the time, every day. I know, but look at this. I know your works. I know your toil. That word in the Greek, it is like you work to the point of exhaustion. I mean, so this is a pretty cool church. I know your works. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who, are, who call themselves apostles. I mean, this is a church that you better know the scripture. This is a church that's like, no, don't just come here saying you're a preacher, a teacher, an apostle, or a prophet. No, 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 no. We, we, we're going to test you. Wouldn't that be a great church? It would be a church that would be hard. I mean, if they were testing even those who called themselves, so they were not, they were calling themselves the apostles, and they were not, and found them to be false. I don't know you. I mean, I would love to be on that church. Because you see, I mean, this is a pretty powerful church. And then when we go, there's even more. I know your works. Now, now look at next Next verse. I know you are enduring patiently. I know you're bearing up for my name's sake. Remember, we got to put the picture of tribulation and people being killed left and right and people being persecuted for the name of Jesus. And people, I mean, they really wanted to quiet the church. And in the midst of all that, the, John has the revelation, I know, and, I, and you have not grown weary. I know that too. Then, verse 6, we're going to read verse 4 and 5, but verse 6, there is one more thing he knows and he even commends them, yet this you have, you hate the works. And I, I tried to find someone that could pronounce that for me. Nicolaitans. That's pretty good to Nickelodeon, but uh, you know, Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, I was going to say. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You know, so he says, I know. He wants you to know that he knows. I'm well aware of your ministry. I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. So he had complete knowledge of all these things concerning. He knew the church service. He knew the church. I mean, they were exhausted. He knew it's at steadfastness that, that this body of believers had patience and they persevered while suffering persecution. He knew of his separation. They stood against those who were evil. They possessed discernment and discipline, enabling them to detect those living in sin. He knew their standards. They were able to spot deceivers in sheep's clothing. How many of you agree that was a great church? Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm not trying to, it's not a catch thing. Now, the Nicolaitans, they profess, they profess to be Christians. And that's the problem. It says that they, they hate the Nicolaitans because they profess to be Christians who were abusing grace. If you didn't know, it's like, so what is it, the Nicolaitans? They thought grace was an excuse to sin. Because of grace, they thought they could do anything they wanted to. But look what it says. God hates that. Amen? Amen. So, I mean, basically... The Nicolaitans, they preached grace was a license to sin. Which is not okay. Because of grace, we stop sinning. Amen. The opposite. We don't want to sin. Amen. You know, so it's not like, wow, grace will cover it. And I, you know, I hope and pray if that's what you think, we should change that. Yes. Amen. Now, so then first we see the commendation of all those things that I know. But then it comes the condemnation. So those are the commendations. Your works, your toil, your patience, your endurance. How you cannot bear with those who are evil. You hate to test those who call themselves apostles. You're enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake. And you, hate, and you have not grown weary. 
Revelation 4 says, nevertheless, that's the condemnation right there. I have this against you. I mean, there had to be like an uh-oh moment, right? <laughs> or a but. But, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now, so this is like the, the duty had trumped the devotion. The regulations were ruining the relationship. I mean, that, that's very clear. God demands to be first. First in our affection. First in our attention. First in our priority. He demands to be first. Now, it doesn't matter if we put God second. You won't do it. Because if, you, if it is that important for Him to be first, it should be important for us to put Him first. Amen. So God is like, He doesn't want it to be in a competition with anything. He wants to have that place. It's like, you know, it, it's like, in, in first love, he did not only love, He says first love. You have left your first love. He's not telling them you don't have love. He's saying first love is when you passionately pursue God's pleasure. First love, and that's what it is. Evidently, you can be doing right stuff and be in a wrong relationship with God. You can be doing right. I mean, talk about this church was doing really good. Evidently, you can be a serving church and a serving Christian and have left your first love. Evidently, you can be a sacrificing church and a sacrificing Christian and have left your first love. You can be a steadfast church and a steadfast Christian and have left your first love. You can be a separated church and a separated Christian and have left your first love. You can be suffering, a suffering church and a suffering Christian and still have left your first love. Now, I think a good example is Martha, the, the encounter with Martha and Mary. In Luke 10, 38. Luke 10, 38. We don't have all the scriptures there and all the things because I just want you to, to see the key points. Because otherwise, you'd be connected so much that you miss what I'm saying. Luke 10, 38 says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him. And uh, the order there points to us that it's like most likely she was the oldest. The house belongs to her. Uh, you, you know, and she had a sister and a brother, Lazarus. A woman named Martha welcomed him to enter her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also, so it was her and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Now remember, she was, she was serving Jesus and she was distracted serving Jesus. And, and that to me is a picture. We can be serving Jesus and be distracted by it. Okay, three amen, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> we can be doing things for Jesus and be distracted with Him, with those things, instead of being focused on Him. So we can. I mean, we can. It, it is a marvelous church. I really think this is a powerful church. When you have all of those things, it's like you're not going to get by if you don't know what you're talking about. You, don't, you cannot go to that church and just say that you're going to preach or teach or prophesy or whatever. No, no, no. This is a very, to me, it's an example of a church. But we got to remember, it's, it's like we got to be careful by saying, well, you know, but I clean the church. Or I visit people. I give on Sundays. I even raised my hand last Sunday. Woohoo! It is like, it is not about doing. No, I'm not saying we don't have to do it. But I'm saying that, you know, we can be doing some things and by now, if it is, you know, about 40 years. So that church was doing everything. They had the program. They had the message. They, they were doing good, but they left something that they had first when they started. The love. Not only love. You know, I, I try to be careful. I was going to call this message, love as a weapon. 
And I thought about, the more that I thought, you know, and I thought, well, if I say that, I'm going to have to explain it. Because, yes, love can be a weapon in negative and positive. But we're talking about our love for Him. You have your first love, not for people, not for your wife or your husband. You left your first love for Jesus. And Jesus is walking among the lampstand. And He's walking among the churches. And He knows those churches as much as He knows each one of us. And I, you know, and the more I pray, it's like every time, if God is speaking to me, to speak it to you, that first has to cut me. And it's like, Lord, I don't want to be the one. I mean, I love God, but do I love God first? He's not saying they don't have love. They don't have the first love. <laughs> Hello? Because it's not like, uh, you know, it, it, that's the, the complete different thing. It's like, no, I love God. Yeah, no, I love God. He wants to be loved first. He wants to have priority. Not second, third. Uh, he doesn't want it to be, he doesn't want it to be part of our program. It's not like, oh, I'm so busy this week. I don't even know if I'm going to go to church. He wants to be the first. And then you plan everything around that. It changes. He's not just a part of our busy lives. He is what He is. So, and again, it is, we will. It is a challenge. And that's why overcoming complacency is so key. Because complacency in the way of, well, I already got this. I got that. I got this covered. And I'm a giver. And I bless people. And I, I'm excited. And I sing in the choir. Or I play an instrument. And I, I, I give alms to the poor. Oh, man, man, come on. This is not bad. It is. If you left your first love. And you're doing just out of a duty. And you're doing just out of... And that's the thing, the difference between religion and relationship. Amen. Because in a relationship, you know, uh, I mean, really, I, I, I have to, to put myself in a position. And, but if I hear any word from God that I feel like God is putting in my spirit, if I'm driving, this, this is what I do, for real. I stop the car. Because it's like, I know how precious a word can be. So I don't tell him, uh, can you tell me later? I'm kind of busy here. Can't you see I'm driving? No, no, no. I find a word to park because I really want to hear. That word can change my life or someone's life. That's what I'm talking about. It is not. I, I do believe we're here. I mean, I, I really believe everybody here loved God. But the big question is, do we love Him First, when we open up our eyes before we touch our cell phone, because usually most of us, that's what we do, because even we don't even have a clock by the bed anymore, it's the cell phone. And before we pray, before we think about the word, before we, we say, God, I, I commit this day to you, it is like, let's see what so and so are saying. At 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or time, whatever time you wake up or, you know, it's like, oh, I need to see it. No, 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 no. This is not prioritizing. This is not putting Him first every day. Putting Him first in relationships. Putting Him first in our marriages. Putting Him first with our kids. Putting Him first in everything we do. This is a big thing because we're talking about being an overcomer. And we saw that for nine times, if you overcome, if you overcome, if you overcome. And then First John talks about, you have overcame. So if I'm going to continue to be in victory, I'm going to have to pay attention. And if, if I'm not on the first love anymore, i got to go back to it. Because it is that important. Come on, church. And we'll see why it's so important. Because many people today, they love God. But they don't love God first. So it's not a matter of not loving. It is a matter of where you put Him. It is like He wants to be the. Not one of. The. That's why for me there's no other way to serve God. But serve Him completely. It's not about giving Him 10%. I give 100%. 
No, in finances. It's like, because if we say that, you know, our life belongs to Him, that we're going to serve Him, we want His will, we want everything that He wants for us, it is like, it is not only 10%. 10% is, we're just saying, I'm really pleased, Lord, thank you. But it is a complete, it is like, are you willing to die for Jesus? Or are you willing to sacrifice so much because you love Him first? Are you willing, like, man, I know, Pastor, man, do you know who's playing today? I do. And I know in our technology time, it's so great, you can put on DVR and, you know, I mean, we do all kinds of things to do the things we want to do. What about God? What about every day? I'm not talking about on Sundays because, you know, this is the Lord's day and that's the day that John the Revelator had the revelation. And, but, I mean, he didn't just have the revelation. He had the revelation because he was in the Spirit. You can be on the Lord's day and be as flesh as flesh can be. <laughs> but he was in the Spirit. And because he was in the Spirit, I mean, what a download. How many of you ever had a, a download that you know it wasn't you? I mean, I'm talking about like, you know, and sometimes, I mean, I remember one time, I, I'm serious, I, I had this dream, and God was speaking to me in the dream, that even in the dream, I said, God, this is too much. And, and I, didn't, I, I didn't know that I was speaking in tongues, in the natural, trying to keep up with what God was downloading into me. And when I woke up, I was like, ah, and I was like, oh. That's how much it was because he who prays in tongues edifies himself. And that's why, I mean, I woke up, I was speaking because I wanted to keep everything that God was speaking to me in that dream. Hello? So again, it is like, uh, have we become complacent? Because, because it's like Martha was distracted. She was serving Jesus. Come on. It was like, uh, I don't know. You, you know, when we prepare a meal and, uh, you know, and now that Sylvia's in Brazil and she's visiting her family. I mean, I'm cooking too. Kind of. I'm finding those things that you can halfway done. So, but I am. Every day. I don't want the kids to go hungry. And then, you know, weeks from now, it's like, oh, they're so skinny. What happened? No, no, no. I want to take care of them. I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. I mean, some things. Uh, last week was the first time that I did uh, uh, a barbecue. Like, I'm not talking burger. In the, I'm talking about meat. I'm talking about it was a, a medium. It was, it was, forget it. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying it, it, it is like, so it does take a lot. But I, I missed my point. That how, that's how good it was. I missed my point. <laughs> right? It was good. <laughs> but we, oh yeah, let's go back. We can be distracted in much serving. And so I was going to talk about the meal. Maybe she was like, I don't know, uh, chicken or because they didn't eat pork. So it had to be chicken, um, you know, the, the casserole and, the, and the potatoes and green beans and the sprouts. And I mean, I don't know. She was preparing something. And, and I mean, for the way that she was, look what she said. She said, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care? That my sister has left me to serve alone. So it's like, therefore, tell her to help me. Now, you got to see this picture. you got to imagine, because Mary was at her feet. Martha comes, and she talks to Jesus instead of telling Mary. And she's telling Jesus to tell Mary what she wanted Mary to know. So she's frustrated. It's like, why can't you tell Mary to help me in the kitchen? <laughs> Can you see that? It is like, why don't you talk to Mary directly? I mean, I don't know. It's like, it's like when someone is talking to someone and they want to point something to you. And instead of telling you, they tell out loud. <laughs> Have you seen that? <laughs> That's what's happening. She's trying. Not only that. I mean, she, she's pretty bossy to tell Jesus to tell someone something. He's the Savior. Hello. He is the Word. And it's like she's putting words in Jesus' mouth. Like, can you tell her? Now, that's what you wanted me to tell her. Why don't you tell her? No, because she won't listen to me. She might listen to you. So you tell her. Bossy. I mean, she's like, I'm serving you here. I'm doing this for you, Jesus. Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Mar I mean, I don't know you. When my mom called me my name twice, 
I'm in trouble. She said, Lave. It's one thing. When she said, Lave, Lave. I'm just saying, you better repent or run. It was one of those. So, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Could it be that, I mean, we're serving Jesus. Could it be that we would be worried and troubled about serving him, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. So it's like, I want my sister to be like me. I want her to serve like me. I, I want, and Jesus said, no, 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 no. No, she chose the good part. I mean, you know. But when he goes back to the first love, and, and this is like maybe in the beginning, and for some of us, it lasts for many, many, many years. But as we see the tribulation, as we see things around us, as we see, you know, and this and that and with frustration and things in church or with people in church or people out of church, it, it is like after a while, it's almost like it, it wears off on us. It is like, yeah, I know, you know, but that's not a big deal. I mean, we still go to church. We still go to Wednesday meetings. You know, I, I kind of read my Bible. I mean, almost every day. Doesn't that count for nothing? No, if you do out of a religion. Because religion is what made the Pharisees. We don't want Pharisees, church. I mean, what would be the Pharisees of today? They do all of those things and they want others to do it. And then it's like it becomes a, a law. And I, I mean, I could point, even, you know, when you go to churches, you don't wear uh, uh, makeup. Oh, if you do, you're going to hell. Or you got a long hair or long dresses or, you know, I mean, in Brazil, in the beginning, uh, the men in 1930s or 40s, the men had to go with hats to the church. Oh, and if they didn't. I still remember that it, it, some churches that I went, if I didn't have a suit on and a tie, I couldn't preach. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, I do believe that you've got to put your best for Jesus. Yeah, Don't misunderstand me. Everything that you do has got to be your best. But He is more concerned with what goes on inside. Yeah. He is looking at the heart. He is looking, I mean, isn't that why David was chosen instead of Saul? It's because it's like, you know, he wasn't the appearance. He didn't look big or huge or muscly. No, no, no. He was a little kid. 16 years old. But his heart was to please the Lord. One thing he wanted, to be in the presence of God every day. So again, it, it is like, you know, in a... Wow, wow. The, the thing that I was thinking about complacency, it's like, you know, I thought about that illustration I shared here not long ago about this couple that they sat on this oh, little bench and it was at night and they would see the moon and they were so in love. The first love that when the, the husband, he saw the moon, first year of marriage, he made a poem for her. How the, the moon was shining. And that's what she brought to his life, that, that shining. And, you know, and she was like, and she cried, and they hugged, and, they, oh, and they, you know, she was just there. I mean, first love. And, and then 40 years later, since we're talking about Ephesus, and they're looking, they're sitting, maybe on the same bench, I don't know. But then a cloud comes in. And if it was 40 years ago, he would even make a poem about the cloud that came in front of the light. And uh, but you still see the light all around the cloud. And she's, he's trying to make the poem. And she's looking at him like, can't you see it's going to rain? <laughs> <laughs> so 40 years before, it would be amazing. 40 years later, it's like, ugh. And Jesus is worried about this. He's not worried. He's, he's pointing to the church. I mean, you've you got it going on, church. I mean, this is the church, Ephesus. But he's not saying a list of things. You left. So you had it before. You left your first love. Amen? I mean, that's the first thing that God wants the first church to know. Is that they left 
the first love. I mean, there's got to be something there, way important for him to be walking among the churches, the golden lampstand, and he points that. Not only that, that's a principle in the Bible. Throughout the Bible, uh, Matthew 6, 33, in the kingdom, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, or God's way of doing things, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 22, 37. Now, and this is the thing, though. If I don't love God first, how am I going to love others? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commitment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. But he's saying you got to love God first. And if I, God, and I put God first, I'm going to love people. You know, I mean, I've seen all kinds of things, and I've seen people, and sometimes young people, or you know, it's like, oh, God, a Pastor, I'd love to be in the ministry. The only problem that I have is, like, I can't stand people. <laughs> There's no such a thing. The more you love God, you want to love on people. The more you put God first, it's like you want to love people. You want them to experience their love. You want to know, for them to know what you know, and to have that relationship with Him. It's, it's, it's like you look and, and you're blessed by it and you're encouraged. And, and it's like, man, I want to have that kind of love. And because you have that, you want others to know too. First love. In giving is the same thing. Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and the first fruits of all your increase. I remember this. Uh, years ago, when I was a pastor in New Jersey, one of my members, you know, I was sharing about giving and tithes and offerings, and, and she came to me, she said, oh, Pastor, I really want to do this, I really want to tithe, but, it, uh, you know, I, I never had anything left. And I don't know what's the problem. And I was like, Doug, I mean. <laughs> so I was nice, and, you know, I didn't say Doug, <laughs> but. And I said, you don't see the problem? I said, no, help me. I really want to know. I said, well, say it again what you just said. And then she said it again. And I said, it's right there. And she said, what do you mean? I said, you just said, what's the problem? No, 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 I did it. I said, yes, you did. And she was like, what's the problem? I said, the problem is that you're giving God leftovers. You're giving God if you have left. So you're putting house payment and car payment and, and groceries, and you're putting uh, your this and that and the other, and you're putting going out on Sundays or Wednesdays or whatever. You know, it's like if you put God first, it means like I'm going to honor Him. Uh, I got my paycheck. Boom, it's done. I'm going to honor Him. I'm going to give Him first. So it is like that, that He would bless the 90. Now, if I spend the hundred and then I want God's blessing, it's not going to happen because the order, I'm not prioritizing love. I give Him on the first day of the week because I want my week to be a blessing. I give to Him, yes, that's why we do it. And that's why we're going to continue to do it. And some people don't even believe in that anymore. But first love is like, I don't give because I want a blessing. I give because I put Him first. I don't give, it is not an exchange, I have an expectation in my heart, but I just want the enemy and the world and whoever needs to know that in my life he is the priority, he is the first, yes. then everything comes after that. So if I'm expecting God to bless the 90, I mean you really, we can do more with 90 than with 100 without his blessing. That's a good clapping point. Right? <laughs> So it's like, again, it's what I said last week. There's too many people waiting for a full-time deliverer when they have become a part-time Christian. <laughs> there is. Sad to say, but it, that, that's what it is. Then he, Jesus gives us four admonitions concerning that condition right there. It's only one thing. You have your left, your first love. Then verse 5 says, Remember, therefore, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember. Some things we don't, but remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. The, the Ephesians were to recall their past commitments, reevaluate their present compromises, refocus on loving God first. 
I mean, really, if Jesus is pointing that out, it's because it's possible if you have lost that first love, you can rekindle again. Why would he point something that is not possible? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repeat and do the first works. Or else I will come. Now watch this because this is serious. I will come to you quickly. Which I believe was in the 5th century. So that's quickly for God. But you don't even see the church in Ephesus anymore. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. When I read that today, it gave me a, a little more. It is like, why would God allow us to be a lampstand if we're not going to multiply first love? Why would God give us influence, not only here, online, and other nations? Why would God give us something so powerful in the midst of darkness? He is allowing us to be a voice, but we're not passionate about it. Why would be, why, I mean, it is like, why do you want influence if you, what you're going to show is not love? Why? Why would I bless you and why would I lift you up? Why would I open doors that no man can shut? Why would I close doors that no man can open? Why would I do all those things for you to be what? Because people, you know, as people see, that's what they do it. And, and that's the thing, church. It is like, and I really, that's why when I do it and when I go to churches and when I travel, that's what my mindset was always like this. I want to give God my best. Best message, best closing, best moment, best energy, best everything. It is like it, that's the least that I can do and still is going to fall short. But I want Him to be first. I want to know what He wants me to know, to tell you. I, I mean, I, I spend, really, every week, hours upon hours, and I go and I do researches. It, it's not because, it, you know, it's like, for me, it's that important. It's like, God, I really want people to, to see and to know. I'm excited about Jesus. Amen. 30 years later, I'm still excited. Amen. I even said this week. Because I, I know, I mean, you know, I got distracted for a moment, and I closed that step ladder on my Eight fingers. Not one. Eight. Bam. I couldn't even say Jesus. I said. Ugh. And then I had to open with my foot. So for like a month now. I mean my hand is swelling. Swelling. In pain. I mean it's crazy. I'm not even going to go there. Went to the doctor. First, the first person was nice. The last person was like, what are you doing here? I said, I need to know if it, at least if it's broken. Whatever you're doing is working. Go home. I said, man, that's kind. Goodbye. I left a little heartbroken, but I thought, okay. And then this week, I was like, I made a declaration. I said, devil, I love worshiping God. I love playing. I, I know I'm not a good player, but I will do my best with what I have. And you try to stop me. I just want you to know. I, I mean, it was a declaration in the spirit. I'm going to play until the last day of my life on this earth. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. I'm not going to stop playing. I rebuke arthritis. I rebuke pain. Uh, if you think you're going to stop me, you're not going to stop me. I know Amen. he's my healer. And I declared, and I stand on it, and I'm, I mean, this is not going to stop. Because that's the goal when the trial comes, is to make us stop doing what we're doing. Amen. Why love God? Why go to church? Why love our name? I mean, if Galatians, Paul had to say, and let us not get weary in well-doing, it's because we would get weary in well-doing. Yeah. Let's not get tired. Right. Well, but people this, and people that, and people don't deserve. It's like, <laughs> we've got to do first for Him anyway. He deserves the glory. So when I do it, it's like, God, I'm going to do it for you. When I clean house or when I wash car, I mean, everything's I'm going to do it for you. Jesus. I want to do the best that I can because I want you to see. I want to please you and worship you in everything I do. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 So that's the thing, though. He says, repent. 
First remember, then he says repent. The four R's are there. Repent is a genuine change of mind about one's spiritual condition. It involves a turning away from. Why would God say repent? You only repent when it's a sin. That's what God be. It's like, so if I don't put love, God, you know, the first love, or going back to the first love, if I need to repent, that is like, it's a sin to love Him second, third, fourth, or in last place. Otherwise, He would not say repent. Otherwise, He would say, remember, I mean, you're doing good, you can do better. No, 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 He said repent. Repent means, oh God, man, I'm sorry, Jesus. I mean, repent is like... Man, I, Jesus, I'm sorry. Yes, I was doing this, that, and the other. I don't want it to be a religious thing. I don't want to become the next Pharisee. I don't want to be the persecutor of the church. Because believe me, some people, they think that they are God's gift. <laughs> to point people's errors, their mistakes in the church. So, I mean, they, they, they think they're God sent, you know, to divide the church. And God says, watch out for that one too. Don't even relate to them. I mean, that's what the scripture says. But they think they are a gift from heaven to bring division. Come on, church. God has called us to walk as a body. You know, my body, I mean, if I'm dealing with this in my hands, I don't go and just chop it off. Oh, yeah, yeah, you work fine for 50 years. Goodbye. I need them. I want them to be healed. So I can still touch and hold mics and play and do everything that I need to do. And, and I mean, you see what it is? It's like you don't just like, yeah, goodbye. Oh. Repentance. Confessing of sin. It's, it's, it's like commit yourself again to a godly life. When we're watching TV, when we're going to a game, when we're doing whatever we're doing, it, it is like it has to be, why I don't do this? Because I love God first. I mean, because He has the priority. I don't have any, I mean, we sing that. And I, I was thinking about those things. We sing so many things that we need to live up to what we're singing. I won't bow to idols. I'll stay strong and worship you every day. Everything that takes the place of God becomes an idol. Everything, even like, oh, in a, you know, uh, or there was that song that people used to sing, give me that old time religion, give me that old time. No, we don't want that. That doesn't work. It's relationship. Martha, he, she wanted that old time religion. Religion doesn't work. I don't do it. Why? Because God is first. Why don't you do that? No, because that's not, no, God is, would not be first if I did it. So, no, He's in first. He's the priority. Thank you, Jesus. So, but you see, that's, that's the thing, though. So, you must go back to John 14, 21. It says like this, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love Him and manifest myself to Him. So that means if I put God first, and that goes to the other side too. If I'm not having God manifest Himself in ways that I want, I need to reevaluate the love that I have for Him. Because it's saying right there, why would God reveal or manifest Him or give some kind of secret if I'm not His friend? If I don't put Him first? If I am a secret agent for the Lord. Remember that one last week? Right? The 007 for Jesus. Yes. That's what we are. Hallelujah. Nobody knows you're a Christian. I'm serious. When I see that church, I'm, I'm second, third meeting the most. It is like we should. If, if you don't know if the person knows Jesus or not, you should be talking about Jesus. Not being afraid. Well, what if I say I'm a Christian and they don't? Well, if you say you're a Christian and then they leave you, they don't deserve your friendship. They got quiet now. No, because if, if the fact of you, the, I, I, that's what I think. It's like sinners can be sinners and not ashamed of it. But the moment we stand up that we are and we're not ashamed of it, it's like, oh, see, you're a radical. No, 
The same way that you prioritize sin, I prioritize Jesus. So if you can be that open about your sin, I can be open about my Jesus. You didn't die for me. He did. Your blood doesn't can do nothing for me. His blood washes me, strengthens me, protects me. His blood gives me life. So yes, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Woo! That yeah, felt good. Because it's like, you know, people who are sinning, they are not embarrassed. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, I'm... No, this is what we are. I'm excited. It's, it's not like, you know, a little bit excited. I'm really excited. I mean, you can't contain excitement. Don't be that excited. Just be a little bit excited. Let's be a, it's the same thing as being a little bit happy. How, do you, how can you be a little bit happy? I think Wednesday I was sharing this. How can we, when people pray for revival, it is like, yeah, but we want a quiet revival. That there is no such a thing. I mean, uh, and I do. Every time someone dies, you, you know, I pray if it is God's will for them to come back, that they would come back. Do you think if someone that I'm praying for comes back in the Catholic, like, I know it's a bad illustration, but do you think people would be like, oh, that is so exciting. <laughs> wow. That person was dead. Wow. I mean, don't you think people would be like, What? I mean, people would be running. People would be thinking that you're crazy. People would be thinking like, what's going on here? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that, that's revival. The person came alive again. Everybody would be excited. Maybe not the ones who would have the inheritance. <laughs> just, I don't know where that came from. Sorry. Yeah, Tom, let's move on. That's a good point. <laughs> Tragedy of life, right there. Tragedy of life is not found in failure, but complacency. Not in you doing too much, but doing too little. Not in you living above your means, but below your capacity. It's not failure, but aiming too low. That is life's, I wouldn't say greatest, you know, but it is life's, life's tragedy. Because the greatest tragedy would be to die without Jesus. <laughs> Nothing m matches that. You know, but it, I, I thought it was a good quote because it's like, there's so many. Tragedy of life is not found in failure, but complacency. Since I got his love, I can do whatever I want. That was the problem. You know, since I, I, I yes, I'm saved and I go to church and things are getting better and I'm prospering. And I, I'm, man, I'm even healed. Hallelujah. Yeah, but then you get used to it. So you don't do what you used to do when you first start. You left that. But you want him to continue to be what he is. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Can you say amen to that? Amen. They were to repeat their first works and serve Christ with a burning heart of love. That's number three. They were to repeat their first works, and I will, I promise you, I will share more on Wednesday. Because I want us to go back and see what was those first things. What was those first works? Why? He, he's telling them they were to repeat the first works and serve Christ. I mean, they were called to revive the original commitments they had made out of love for Christ. At the time of their conversion. And four, refusal to repent would result in their removal. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Then, Revelation 2, 7 says, He who has an ear, I love this because he's talking to the church, but now he goes to each individual. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the message is for the church. What is he saying to you? That's what it is. The message is for the body of Christ at large. What are you listening? He who has an ear, let him or her, let him or her hear what the Spirit is saying. So the message is for the churches. What are you listening? Yeah. Wow. To him 
or to her who overcomes. Overcomes what? In this case, complacency. He who overcomes. The temptation of not putting him first. He who overcomes. I mean, the compensation is there, and it's amazing. The Lord promised, To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of God. To him who overcomes the pressure. To him who overcomes discomfort. To him who overcomes, I mean, today, political correctness. We can say that. We can do that. We can be that. To him who overcome the divide. Any place. At home, at work, at, at school. To him who overcome. To him who overcome. So maybe you want to serve God. Be in a first love. But maybe people around you, are, or they don't want to be. I, I remember another thing that I've heard. This is in the church in Brazil. And this girl, she got saved. I mean, she was on fire for God, but she was living with this guy. This is the truth. I've heard that testimony myself in 92 or 93. And I still remember. And the girl wanted to go to church and she wanted to serve God. And she was on that first love. It's like, man, she was going to classes. She was going to discipleship. She, was, she got baptized. And this guy was living with her. She, he didn't want it. He didn't want it. He didn't want it. He put her down. He called her names. I mean, he was just trying to, no, why would you? Don't you love me? I, I do. I love you. But I love God more. I mean, you could see that she was experiencing that first love until she got tired of it, of this guy. And she said, you know what? I'm inviting you to go to church to experience what I'm experiencing. I mean, uh, this is it. If you're not going to go to church and love God as I love God, uh, you know, I mean, you're welcome to come to heaven with me, but I'm not going to go to hell with you. Amen. Boom. And she left him. It's like... And, and again, she took a stand. It's like, and again, it's like Jesus is saying, you have left that. Yeah. You know, so we cannot, church. Again, we cannot compare ourselves. We cannot look how others are serving Jesus. We have individually. I'm going to go back to that first love. That I would dig into the scriptures. I'm reading a book now. Uh, it, it talks about the effects of the internet in the brain. Quite interesting. And I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. You know, and I mean, it's psychologists and it's study after study, hundreds and hundreds of people. So we're not talking about, yeah, it's his thought. Oh, no, the idea is this. People thought that because of Internet, we would become smarter. It didn't happen. And he proves in the book because before you would have to investigate before you would need to read the book page after page after page and that's what made people smart they would get to the point of the message but now everybody's more interested in the point yeah. give me the point give me what it is give me what you're trying to say i mean most preachers today they give you three four points and then you go home 20 minute message and that's it no 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 no. i don't want that thank god i never did that i want to see for myself i mean i heard several preachers preach on, on revelations too i want to know in my knowing what are you saying to me so i can say to them amen. and there is amen yes and there is no other way to do this by just giving you the points I can give you the point. It's going to do us no good if the only thing we know and the only thing in a relationship, you know, and, and, you know, and, and, and I mean, people say that, uh, you know, that women usually, they can talk 5,000 to 7,000 words a day or something. I mean, this does not happen in my house. Okay? Does it? I'm the talker. <laughs> right? You can, you can say it. It's okay. Yeah. yeah in, in Bella, too. There we go, baby. We got it. <laughs> I mean, I'm way up there, 7,000 words. It, you know, but it, in a conversation, if you talk that much, that's because of the internet. It's like, so what are you trying to say? Give me the points. Well, I just gave you an hour of points. I cannot even break them down because everything is part of the message. That's the thing. So internet has made us a little bit slow in our thinking because now we want our points for everything. 
points in how to love each other, points in how to love our neighbor, points in how to love our spouse, points how to love people in church. It's like, what's the point of this? Uh, it, it became, uh, I mean, we lost that ability, and that's what made people smarter. They went to book after book, and that's, I mean, I still have it, and I love it. I mean, I do love paper better than the screen. I do. Because something happens when you're investigating. Uh, you know, the only problem is that they put the font too little. And I refuse to wear glasses. And that's why my Bible keeps like large print, large print. I got one now, super large print. Yes. Because it's like, yes, I can read it. You know. But that's the thing, though. So if we're going to go back to first love, we're going to have to change a lot. And I know it is too much for one service. But we've got to have to understand this, and I will get into it Wednesday. Love is a weapon. Jesus would not emphasize for the first church, the first thing he says, the only thing he says is like, get back to the first love. I mean, it wasn't bad. If you're confronting the Nicolaitans, because grace covers everything. I mean, that would, it would be like the some, not all of it, but some of the grace messages we, do, we listen today. Oh, no, it's okay. Grace will cover it. And they never change it. Yeah. How, I mean, how can you not change? It, that's the thing. It, it's like if, until you see that, it's like it's not okay. Change will not come. And I always say this. Change is not a change until you change. Yeah. If you want to change, you've got to change. It's like, it's on you. It's not on me. It's like, we got to embrace it. It's like, yes. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to be an overcomer and you're going to have an overcoming life, get back, repent, redo. It is, that's what I want for you. It's like, yeah, get back to what you used to do. Yeah. And we're going to see that Wednesday. Amen. Yeah. Were you blessed today? Yeah. Stand with me. Thank you, Lord. Again, it is an individual thing. It might be a one word. It might be the whole thing. And that's why we have the message online. You can go and listen again. You know, but Father, I pray, Lord God, and I hope that I communicated. I pray, Father, that you would seal this word in our hearts with the blood of Jesus. I pray that we won't take lightly. I pray that we wouldn't take it for granted. I pray that we would go back and listen to it again. I pray, Father God, that even if we're not where you want us to be, that we would reconsider, that we would repent, that we would go back. How it was the first year, the first month, the first day when one, we got saved. The fire that was burning. The things we did. The, Lord, the, 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 the positions we had to take. Lord, when we stood our ground and we say, yes, this is what I believe. Lord, may we never be afraid of declaring that we are Christians. May we never be afraid or, Lord God, ashamed of, of the gospel of Jesus. May we never be ashamed, Lord God, to, to, to say what you say and to stand by what you said, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Bless everyone here. Bless everyone at home. And Lord, we want to have this overcoming life. In Jesus' name. So I pray once again for a divine impartation. I pray, Father God, that we would just like examine ourselves throughout this week. Lord God, if we don't, or what are the areas that your Holy Spirit would point it out? Not out of accusation, condemnation, but Lord, I know when that revelation comes, and Lord, when we embrace it, transformation can take place. So I ask you to bless everyone here. Bless our families, Lord God. Bless everyone at home. And I declare, Lord, we're not going to embrace complacency. No, 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 no. Because we are overcomers. In Jesus' name. Are you an overcomer? Come on, let's give it up one more time. Amen. He's worthy.